Um, so for the next half hour, we will talk about the management of papillary lesions of the breast. Okay. Papillary lesions are a very heterogeneous group, and they comprise a wide spectrum of lesions. They, are, they extend from benign lesions such as interductal papillomas, papillomas that exhibit foci of atypia or carcinoma in situ within it, DCIS with papillary growth, including intracystic papillary um, carcinoma, and then invasive papillary carcinoma. Papillary lesions can be categorized into two groups depending on their location in the breast. They can be central or peripheral. Um, in general, uh, pathologically, papillary lesions on the breast develop as tufts of epithelium, and I'm going to try to use my mouse here, um, with a fibrovascular core, which is what we see here, this pink area here. And they arborize into branching papillae, um, and we can see that the purple areas in the periphery here are the epithelium of the papillary lesions. And typically they go on and they protrude into a duct lumen, and if you can imagine this, this is actually the, a dilated or distended duct, and what sometimes we see, we see them as actually just cysts, but they really represent ducts. Starting with the solitary central papillomas, as their name implies, they are often solitary. They arise in the large lectiferous ducts near the nipple. The patient typically presents symptomatic, that is, she presents with spontaneous nipple discharge. It's either bloody, serous, serosanguinous, or clear. And often the patient has a trigger point where the area is palpated and the discharge can be elicited. That's very helpful for the surgeon because clinically they can then determine at what location the offending duct is, uh, is and they can go in and when they, prior to their duct excision. On mammography, solitary central papillomas are not typically seen. The mammogram is usually normal. However, one can see dilated ducts or a single dilated duct, associated calcifications, or associated nodule. Here on your left, the image on your left is, um, you can see a small oval uh, nodule. There's some coarse heterogeneous calcifications associated with it in the retroareolar region. Um, here is another example on your right of a single dilated duct, and there are some few punctate coarse calcifications um, within the duct. Both of these patients, when they went to duct excision, had benign papillomas. On ultrasound, if we get lucky, we can see a uh, nicely uh, dilated duct, as seen on your left. Oops, sorry about that arrow. Um, a nice dilated duct, and we can see an intraluminal filling defect, and here is another example with a little bit more lobulated. Um, and if we can put the color Doppler on it, or the color on it, um, one can see vascularity. That is very helpful because sometimes when you see ec um, hypoechoic lesions within a duct, one is trying to decide whether this is a neoplastic process such as a papilloma or papillary carcinoma or DCIS versus uh, just um, pertinaceous debris within ductectasia. So putting the color on it is very helpful to determine whether this um, is a vascular lesion. And we typically don't do MRI, breast MR, to evaluate for spontaneous nipple discharge, but this is a nice example um, of a uh, patient who presented with um, discharge. Um, often the nipple can uh, enhance in a, mam in a, excuse me, a contrast enhanced MR, but one can see in this case that there is a nice little solid um, enhancing nodule in the retroareolar region, and this ha happened on duct excision to be a papilloma. Ductography is still the procedure of choice in a patient eliciting nipple discharge. And the reason is because we used to evaluate the number of introductal lesions, the extent of a lesion, and its location. What we typically do is we clean the skin with either, either uh, betadine or um, alcohol. Then the orifice of the duct is cannulated with a 30-gauge galactography uh, needle catheter unit. And of note that um, needle has a blunt end, a blunt tip, so we always tell the patient that it's really not going to hurt. We're not making an, uh, a little hole. We're actually just cannulating the orifice that's already there. Um, and then we go on to a proc um, inject approximately one cc of iodinated contrast slowly into the duct. 
we then rapidly take the patient to the mammography unit and obtain magnification views of the retroareolar region as well as standard mammographic images and orthogonal projections. Um, this uh, image on your uh, right is an image of a normal ductogram. This is a normal uh, caliber duct. Um, and then one can see normal branching and arborization of the uh, ducts distally. What can be seen on ductography, where most commonly are filling defects, you can also see uh, ductal distension, duct wall irregularity, or complete ductal obstruction. Uh, these are examples from a ductogram with a patient with spontaneous uh, discharge on mammography was negative. Um, one can see a mildly dilated duct extending from the retroareolar region, and then one can see a small irregular filling defects actually distal to to that. Um, that happened to be a benign papilloma on excision. This is another example of a patient with discharge. In this case, this patient had um, a dilated um, duct extending from the nipple. This is you know, much more dilated. And one can see uh, an irregular filling defect uh, within this uh, duct, and actually it's at a branching point, which is typically where papillomas can arise at branching points within the duct. Actually, the um, papilloma appears to be extending into the uh, smaller branches. This was, again, benign on excision, a benign papilloma. However, ductography can sometimes be helpful, and some of the findings can be surprising. In this case, um, patient had clear nipple discharge. We performed ductography on her, and um, her, as you can see, the caliber of these ducts are really uh, within normal limits. They're not, mar they're not dilated, but one can see that there are multiple small filling defects within the ducts, and if we can see posteriorly, they really go all along multiple ducts. This patient had DCIS. On mammography, retrospectively, we went back, and still we were not able to see any calcifications in that region. This is another patient who presented with a palpable mass, and we can see that hyperdense mass in the axillary region. Um, that happened to be an enlarged abnormal lymph node. Um, she also had presented with the clinical symptoms of bloody nipple discharge. On ductography, one can see uh, a dilated duct extending towards the upper outer quadrant, and one can see distally that some of these um, ducts here are truncated, some are um, are pushed to the side, are displaced, and actually this represents a poorly differentiated carcinoma. Um, solitary central papillomas, the management for them is surgical excision. Most of them are benign on histology, however rarely some of them can exhibit some foci of atypia or DCIS in the epithelial components, but that is uncommon. The real reason why they undergo duct excision is because the patient is symptomatic. They are presenting with spontaneous nipple discharge, and uh, most of the time the surgery is really treating the patient's symptoms. Um, one can sometimes do preoperative ductography on the day of surgery, and I have found that that typically um, that is very helpful, but we do it often when the surgeons um, uh, feel that it is helpful to them. Um, so we don't do it as often. This case, in this patient, she probably um, should have had preoperative ductography. She had had a, a spontaneous nipple discharge for which she underwent a duct excision. And on your left, you're seeing images, uh, post-surgical images, excuse me, um, with um, an area of architectural distortion in the retroareolar region. This represents her uh, scar from a previous surgery. However, she at this time had presented with recurrent nipple discharge. So we had um, a ductogram performed, um, and one can see dilated duct proximally with her um, offending papillary lesion, which was probably not excised uh, at the original um, surgery. Um, excision of papillomas on percutaneous biopsy for the diagnosis and treatment of symptomatic nipple discharge was suggested recently by Dennis and Steve uh, Parker. Uh, in his article in um, AJR in the year 2000. He looked at 43 women who had 50 introductal lesions who had presented with uh, nipple discharge and who had a final diagnosis of papillary lesions. 
45 of these biopsies were performed by an 11-gauge mammogram probe, and five were performed with an automated core biopsy device. And his results were that he found 97% of these patients that were biopsied with the 11-gauge mammotome probe experienced resolution of symptoms at 13-month follow-up. And he felt that, you know, his suggestion is that maybe we can go on and excise these papillary lesions percutaneously with the mammotome uh, probe. However, he did have significant number of complications. Uh, five patients had small hematoma, excuse me, three patients had small hematomas. One was, had brisk bleeding, which was treated with thrombin injection, and one had an areolar biopsy, which was treated with plastic surgical repair. And on follow-up, several had moderate pain after the procedure. So for those reasons, I think that people um, still feel that surgical excision is the way to go, and at our institution, this is the way we treat them. Moving on to multiple peripheral papillary lesions. As their name states, they are often multiple. They arise from the small terminal ducts. Um, usually, the patient is asymptomatic, and these are usually encountered on routine screening uh, mammograms. When symptomatic, the patients do present or can present with um, spontaneous nipple discharge about 20% of the time, and less commonly with a palpable mass. On mammogram, they can be seen as multiple well-circumscribed round masses, um, typically in a low bar distribution. Now, this is the classic and mini case that you see this, and you really can suggest that this is what we're looking at, multiple peripheral papillomas. This is another beautiful example of that. One can see, again, multiple well-circumscribed nodules. Some of them actually are displaying the coarse heterogeneous calcifications that can be associated with these nodules. Um, and these almost look like they're hanging off a dilated duct. This is a, a very nice case. And one, one can see this and really suggest that this is what we're looking at. However, that typical finding is not what we often see. Uh, more commonly, we encounter just a small focus of coarse heterogeneous calcifications. Sometimes they may be associated with a nodule, and this is a little bit more difficult to interpret as, um, you know, most likely uh, representing a peripheral papilloma. So, for example, um, all of these three images are from three different patients that um, had undergone a core biopsy and had a result of a benign papilloma on core biopsy. The image on your left on excision, all of these three patients went to excision. This one actually on excision was a benign papilloma. This one in the middle was a papilloma with atypia. And this one was papillary DCIS. So um, basically when we look at these, it's a little bit hard to tell. And all of these patients are placed in the BIRADS4 category and undergo biopsy. When the nodules present uh, excuse me, when the, mass, the um, lesions present as a uh, uh, mass, um, on ultrasound we can see them, we can do an ultrasound, and they can appear as a homogeneous hypoechoic solid mass. Sometimes there can be a little bit of heter heterogeneity within them, but most of the time they are homogeneously hypoechoic. Histologically, they are indistinguishable from the solitary papillomas. Um, they are benign, or they can harbor foci of atypia or carcinoma in situ. However, this is at a much higher rate than seen in the solitary papillomas. In addition, they can be associated with atypical ductal hypoplasia, ductal carcinoma in situ, and lobular neoplasia in the surrounding breast tissue. So the management for patients with papillomas with foci of atypia or with papillomas with DCIS is a recommendation of surgical excision. Um, papillomas with ADH have a relative risk of about one, oh, excuse me, 7.5 times that of those with papillomas without ADH. Now, what has been shown is that the risk appears to be confined to the ipsilateral breast, not bilateral. Therefore, these lesions are, uh, may represent actually uh, precursor lesions. And that's very worrisome, and that's one of the reasons that although people say that papillomas with atypia by itself, that's a benign finding. Um, one can suggest that really they really should go to excision because they could represent precursor lesions. Now, the problem really be, uh, is what is the management of benign papillary lesions on corneal biopsy? When you get this on a corneal biopsy, what should you do? Well, that is really controversial. There are enough papers out there that say that the patient should undergo surgical excision as the ones that say that the patient should just have radiographic follow-up. <clears throat> 
And the difficulty has been uh, in part because it is difficult for pathologists to distinguish between just benign and malignant papillary lesions on surgical specim specimens. And it becomes even more difficult when they're trying to make that differentiation on just fragmented core specimens. In addition, it is difficult to distinguish between a benign sclerosing papilloma with entrapped epithelium from invasive elements within a papilloma. And lastly, a single papillary lesion can be very heterogeneous. So parts of it can be benign and parts of it can have foci of atypia and DCIS. So it is uncertain whether the histologic features seen on corneal biopsy are really representative of the entire lesion, sort of like an undersampling. Um, here uh, is an image of a patient that actually had a papillary lesion. Most of the lesion was uh, benign. However, there was a focus of um, DCIS within the papilloma, and one can see these rounded spaces that can be seen in the cribriform DCIS. So within the actual papillary lesion, there was a focus of DCIS. Papillary lesions with atypia, it, within these uh, lesions, the atypia can sometimes occupy just a small portion of the papilloma, less than 25%. And in cases with their foci of atypia in the papilloma, 63% of these may have ADH in the surrounding tissue. This is an example of a patient that had um, a core biopsy for benign papilloma, and we see the specimen um, on your um, left. And um, on your right, we see the specimen of the excisional biopsy. And when she went to excision, this happened to be an atypical papilloma, as seen by the thick arrow. And then there was an adjacent focus of DCIS. Um, this is a table from an, uh, an article that actually is in press, and it will come out in, the radio in radiology in February um, of this, uh, 2006. And actually, uh, my colleagues and I reviewed uh, our cases of benign papillomas and core biopsy that either went to uh, surgical excision or had long-term follow-up of at least two years. We looked at 42 patients with 43 lesions, um, and 36 of these lesions underwent surgical excision, and seven of them had long-term follow-up, two to three years. And this is a summary of those histologic and imaging findings at surgical excision for the 36 patients. So we look at these at excision, 14 of them were papilloma, were benign. Um, Two were papillomatosis, which actually is not really in the papillary lesion category. It really represents uh, an extension of fibrocystic change. Um, eight were papilloma with ADH or atypia. Two really were papillary DCIS. And 10, no residual lesion was identified. And in these 10, um, there was evidence that a core biopsy had been performed. So we know that what was taken out was the area uh, where the biopsy had been or where the lesion had, had been. So significant is that two were DCIS and eight were papilloma with atypia on excision. That, that's a significant number. This is an estimate of the lesion upgrades to either ADH DCIS or ADH or DCIS. If we look at all our patients, the 42 patients, 17% were upgraded to ADH. 4.8% uh, were upgraded to DCIS after the biopsy. And if we combine these, 21% were upgraded to ADH or DCIS. That's fairly high. And if we look at just the ones that were excised, that the 35 patients with the 36 lesions, the numbers are higher. 20% were upgraded to ADH, 5.7 were upgraded to DCIS, and 26% were upgraded to either ADH or DCIS. So that's significantly high. When you think when you're following a patient and you put somebody in a probably benign category, you are assuming that the patient has a 2% or less chance of malignancy. This 4.8 you know, to 5.7% is definitely higher than that. So for those reasons, um, our recommendation is that benign papillomas on corneal biopsy should get a recommendation of surgical excision. And lastly, I'm going to speak about papillary carcinomas. They are rare. They represent about 1% of all breast cancers. They occur in older patients. There's a higher incidence among African-American women. Clinically, uh, most of these patients present with a large palpable mass in the retroareolar region, 
most of them, about 90% of them present this way. Less commonly can present with nipple discharge. On mammogram, this is the classic example of a large palpable hyperdense mass. They're a circumscribed mass. They're typically in the retroareolar region, but they don't have to be. Um, less commonly, but also one can see single, multiple clusters of pleomorphic linear branching calcifications. This is a, a beautiful example of casting calcifications. Um, almost like this, the, it has that snakeskin appearance um, that has been described with papillary DCIS. So this is another presentation. When they present as masses, and, and we, tip, you know, we will go on to do an ultrasound, they can be seen on ultrasound as complex cystic masses with a solid component. In this case, this patient um, has a hyperdense mass in the retroareolar region, um, and one can see a, mostly a solid lobulated mass with some cystic elements within it. One can also see the typical uh, large uh, cyst with a mural nodule. These are examples of two different patients which look very similar and um, we, one can put the color on it and one can see the vascularity that these nodules are vascular. Um, and less commonly, one can see fluid fluid levels, a mass with fluid fluid levels. And what this is representing is chronic hemorrhage within this um, mass. These lesions are typically very vascular and very friable, and they bleed within itself. So this represents chronic hemorrhage, and it's just blood. On histology, they usually arise in a dilated duct rather than a cyst, as, as we typically call them intracystic lesions. Um, it, it really is just a duct. They are intraductal lesions, and what I mean by that is that it's most of the time, even those large lesions are non-invasive. They represent DCIS. Differentiating between intraductal and invasive papillary carcinoma, however, can be difficult for us, as well as on histology. Um, on histology, one can see complex branching uh, papillary fragments, and you see these here coming out uh, with uh, numerous single cells. Uh, this is a blow up of that. Um, they can be columnar plasmacytoid features. They have variable areas of atypia uh, within these uh, cells uh, and they lack um, bare oval nuclei which are really representative of just that basement membrane to try to differentiate between invasive and non-invasive. Um, the management of non-invasive and invasive papillary carcinoma is uh, lumpectomy and radiation therapy or mastectomy. Axillary nodal metastases um, is uh, very low. Um, predominantly, these lesions are low grade. They have a very good prognosis. When they recur, um, they, they often don't recur, but when they, they do, it's typically because they have been incompletely excised. And infrequently, they can progress to invasive papillary carcinoma. Um, this is um, images from a, a mammogram of a patient who had had a solitary uh, mass in her breast. She underwent lumpectomy the year, uh, a year ago. Um, this is her lumpectomy scar right here, this area of distortion. She refused radiation therapy, and one year later, she presents with uh, this mammogram. Uh, and now she has multiple uh, circumscribed nodules seen anterior and posterior to the biopsy site. On ultrasound, all of these nodules are well-circumscribed solid masses. And on biopsy, they happen to be recurrent papillary carcinoma. Thank you.